The power plant consisted of four basic elements. A nuclear heat source, equipment that would convert the heat energy into electrical energy, and a system to dispose of excess heat, all regulated by an extensive network of instruments and controls. Jim Barnett, in charge of this operation, who will tell you about this critical phase. We took every precaution in the book, and some that weren't there, to make sure this would work right the first time. When the entire system had been carefully tested, it was put into operation. We were then ready to begin loading the reactor core. One by one, the fuel elements were removed from barrels in which they'd been shipped, carefully separated from one another. Each of these bars containing approximately 500 grams of uranium-235 was then unwrapped, inspected, and wiped clean of any dust. The fuel elements into a fuel storage tank. This preliminary test proved that the fuel elements, when assembled, would not go active prematurely. After each element was in place, instruments were read, and an evaluation of reactivity was made and reported over loudspeakers. The crewmen were protected by a shield of approximately eight feet of water as they lowered the fuel elements into the fuel storage tank. Later, each of these steel and uranium bars would be transferred underwater to the nearby reactor core. Every step of the testing was meticulously monitored and regular announcements made to the workers assigned to the loading crew. Total U-235 content of the assembled core is 13.376 kilograms. Coefficient of reactivity, 0.935. The assembly is still subcritical. When all preliminary tests were completed, we began to transfer the fuel elements one by one and started loading the reactor core. As each fuel element went into place, the count rate of neutrons released gradually increased. Within the core, to prevent the reactor from inadvertently going critical, control rods were in place. This gradual activation of the pile took almost nine hours. In this tense atmosphere, we changed crews twice. Above us, it was dark and miserable. With the approach of winter, the sun was preparing to set for the year. Finally, our meters reported a significant increase of reactivity. The whole camp was standing by, waiting, tense. By the ninth hour, the last fuel element had gone into place. A plot showed the location of every bar. Then the control rods were gradually withdrawn until the reactor went critical at 6.52 a.m. Now here it is. With all five control rods withdrawn 6.24 inches, PM 2A went critical at 0.652 hours. Within the next few weeks, the final touches were put to Camp Century. Today, powered by its nuclear reactor, this unique installation is a completely modern community, deep under the ice. This is a far cry from the primitive Jamesway huts of the work camp, where three showers serve 250 men. Here, there are showers for all, and facilities for every modern convenience. Among the many sophisticated facilities at Camp Century is the dispensary, complete in every detail. For while the remote research community is isolated by 150 miles of ice and snow, its medical capabilities can cope with almost any emergency. It also has a small chapel for regular religious services. And it boasts the largest deep freeze in the world. Here is enough food to feed the camp for several months. Everything from steak to fruit salad.
The modern spacious kitchens provide a well-balanced and appetizing menu. To satisfy the enormous appetites that working in this climate produces means extra rations, but there's always more than enough. Except for the fact that they have no windows, the men of Camp Century live exactly as do other soldiers. Their quarters are modern, spacious, comfortable, and are not lacking in any detail. Today, Camp Century is being operated as a year-round Arctic Research Center. The men who built the camp have long since been replaced military and civilian scientists from the Polar Research and Development Program. As part of man's efforts to probe deeper and deeper into the secrets of the universe, an elaborate program of tests and experiments is being carried out. At this very moment, somewhere, men from Camp Century are at work, within the city itself or out on the ice cap. Only Mucklock remains from the original contingent. This is the story of Camp Century, of the army engineers who carved out the underground city, of the many other men of the United States Army who made this project possible, and of man's never-ceasing quest for knowledge.